Yes, I'm Simon Marlow. I'm uh, currently working at Facebook, and I'm going to talk to you about concurrent and parallel programming in Haskell. So since some of you, I'm sure, will not be familiar with Haskell, I'd like to give you a quick overview of what Haskell is all about. So first of all, Haskell is a purely functional programming language. It's one of very few purely functional programming languages. So pure functions can't do side effects at all. There is a separate world of what we call the I.O. monad in which you can do side effects, and you can call pure functions from the I.O. monad, but not vice versa. Haskell is a strongly typed programming language, so that means you can't get any memory errors, you can't get any crashes at runtime. Once the program has passed the type checker, it's safe. But unlike some other programming languages that have strong type safety, Haskell has type inference. So that means that you don't have to write types if you don't want to. On the other hand, we like to write types on top-level functions because it's good documentation. Haskell has something called lazy evaluation. That means that a function doesn't evaluate its arguments unless those arguments are actually required at runtime. So this is a, there's a choice between lazy evaluation and strict evaluation, and the jury is still out on which is the best. There are advantages and disadvantages on both sides, but for better or worse, Haskell has lazy evaluation. So a big difference between Haskell and languages like Java and Python and so on is that Haskell doesn't have objects. It doesn't have a notion of inheritance. Instead, the data model is based on algebraic data types and pattern matching. It's a very nice, lightweight, flexible way to deal with data. Haskell has something called type classes, which shouldn't be mixed up with classes in object-oriented languages. Type classes in Haskell are used to, to do principled overloading. So when you have a function that can have different behavior depending on what type of argument it's, it's applied to, um, we give that a type class, and the type class implements a different methods depending on the type. Uh, and something that you'll probably notice very prominently when you see some Haskell syntax is that the syntax of function application is very different from most other languages. In Haskell, function application is done by writing the arguments with the space between. You write f, x, y, rather than f brackets x, comma, y. So just bear that in mind when you see some Haskell code. Oh, and of course, being purely functional uh, is very good for parallelism because it means there are no interactions between different uh, sub-expressions. So, yeah. so concurrency and parallelism is all about doing things at the same time from a high level. Uh, that's a generalization of what it's about. But if we look closely at what's going on, some of the things we want to do have very, very clear differences. So I've lost my animations. <laughs> oh well, so I'll have to manage. Um, so I'd like to divide the world into parallelism and concurrency. So one way to think about the difference is a sort of a catchphrase is that parallel is about multi-core programming, whereas concurrency is about multi-threaded programming. So parallel programming is about using multiple processors, whether they be multiple cores, multiple chips, or even multiple machines. It's about using all the processing power you can get to make your program run faster. Whereas concurrency is about interactions. It's about programs that have multiple interactions with the outside world or between different subsystems within the same program. Um, so concurrency you can think of as, a, as a, a way to write programs, whereas parallelism is a way to use the hardware. And the goals are quite different. So when you're writing a parallel program, the goal is to get the answer quicker. So you don't really care how it works underneath, as long as you get the answer quicker than you would have done if you were only using one computer. Whereas the goal with concurrency is to do multiple things at the same time. It really is to have multiple interactions, whether it, by, whether it be interactions with clients in a web server or to have your GUI running at the same time as some other background processing tasks. It's to do multiple things at the same time. So one important difference between parallel and concurrent programming is that parallel programming tends to be deterministic. So you want to get the answer quicker, but you want it to be just one answer, and only one answer will do. So it's deterministic in the sense that the inputs determine the output. Whereas concurrency tends to be non-deterministic because there are multiple threads, and each of those threads has effects, and the effects get interleaved non-deterministically at runtime. And you probably don't want a random result from your program, so it's your job as a programmer to manage that non-determinism and to make sure the program does what you expect it to do. Parallel programs can be declarative because there's no inbuilt notion of ordering there, whereas in concurrent programming, there is an order. The events that come in from the external interactions can come in any order, and you need to respond to those. So there's a notion of time in a concurrent program. So some examples of the kind of things 
that are parallel as opposed to concurrent. So image manipulation is a good example of a parallel algorithm or a parallel workload. And there tends to be lots of parallelism inherent in image manipulation because each pixel uh, is often completely independent of all the others. So we just like to get a single image back and we don't care how the program is executed, whether it's executed on multiple cores or on a GPU or whatever, as long as we get the answer quicker than we would have done. Machine learning, database joins. You know, database joins tend to be done with MapReduce on multiple machines, that sort of thing. These are all parallel types of problem. Whereas something like a web server, where there are multiple interactions with external clients or where there's a GUI, where you need to have the GUI running at the same time, and being responsive at the same time as some background processing or some uh, or connecting to network servers in the background. These are all examples of programs with multiple interactions. So they're concurrent programs. So our basic premise in Haskell's approach is that these different approaches, different, different trade-offs, need different APIs. So you can solve the problem more effectively if you're given an API that's more suited to the task. So Haskell's basic philosophy is that we want to give you the right tool for the job. Okay? So we want to look at your problem. If it's a parallel program, a parallel workload, we want to give you a parallel API that's suited to that job. So Haskell has multiple parallel APIs. We've got something called parallel annotations, there's data flow, parallel arrays, and we can run on GPUs as well. There's a whole swathe of these things, and each of them tends to be suited to particular classes of task. We also have concurrency APIs, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about concurrency later in the talk. And within concurrency, there are multiple different ways to do synchronization. Um, we've got something called MVAR, which is very basic synchronization, and then transactional memory, uh, which you may have heard of. So the other part of the philosophy that, we, uh, that Haskell embodies is the idea of having simple primitives. So we like to build very little into the language itself. We like the primitives to be very simple, very easy to understand, and at the same time, we like to use Haskell's powerful abstraction mechanisms to build layers on top of that. And I'm going to show you one example of that using concurrency in a short while. So one of the programming models that we have for doing parallel programming in Haskell is called strategies. So here is a, a fragment from a program that I often use as an example. This program happens to do uh, solving of Sudoku problems. Um, and this program takes a list of problems as an input and it runs a function called solve over each of those problems in the list and produces the results. So the, the map function is part of the Haskell standard library. That's the function that takes a function as an argument, in this case, solve, and it applies that function to each of the elements in a list. And the list here is the third, uh, second argument to map. So how can we parallelize that? Well, in Haskell, you can parallelize it very easily by adding this. So the syntax here with the back quotes means that using is an infix operator. So using has two arguments. This is its first argument, the original expression, and here is its second argument. And the second argument here is what we call a strategy. And the strategy says something about how you want to evaluate the expression in the first argument. And parlist is a strategy that happens to evaluate each of the elements of the list in parallel. And the rseq thing on the end is just saying it's, it's telling parlist how to evaluate each of the elements. So I'm not going to go into detail about how this works, but from a high level what's going on is that we're, we've got the original expression that describes what to do, and we're adding a strategy that says how to evaluate it in parallel. And you can use this idea on any program that uses a map. So anytime you see a map in a Haskell program, you can do this. You can get parallelism almost for free. And it turns out that that's very common. People like to write maps in, in parallel. Uh, sorry, like to write map in, in uh, Haskell programs. So it happens quite a lot. Um, and you'd be surprised how often you can apply this technique you can get some parallelism for free. But why does it work? Well, one reason it works is that Haskell being a purely functional programming language, we know that this function solve is guaranteed not to have any side effects that can interact with other instances or other calls of that function. So we know that evaluating each of these elements of the list can be done in parallel, can be done in any order, and that won't change the result. So we get a deterministic answer. So it's not only the same as the answer you got before you added the parallelism, it's the same as the answer you get on any number of cores. 
so that's a useful property. Something else is that um, adding parallelism here was modular. Notice that we didn't change the original program at all. So the original expression, map solve problems, is still there unchanged in the program. All we did is add some text at the end here that describes how to evaluate it in parallel. So you might have reasonably expected me to have to change the map to be a parallel map. Now that's a reasonable thing. In fact, we didn't even have to do that. We just left the original expression as it was and added the parallelism later. And that's possible because, because of lazy evaluation that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. In fact, this expression generates a lazy data structure that can be consumed by this strategy over here. And that's how you can separate the, the parallelism from the program. So that's one of the programming models we have. So there are some nice tools that we have as well in Haskell for measuring the, the parallelism and for investigating what's going on at runtime. This is a couple of screenshots from a tool that we've got called ThreadScope. So ThreadScope shows you a sort of timeline of your program from the beginning of the program to the end and what was going on in the various processes. The one at the top is just a one core execution of the program, so we can see it just kept running till the end. And on the bottom, we've got the four core execution of the parallel program. And you can actually dive in and see in, in quite, um, quite a lot of detail what's going on when you zoom in and, and look at that. And it's been very useful not just for understanding the programs, but understanding the runtime and making us make the, uh, the implementation of Haskell more efficient. So the first programming model I talked about was strategies. There's another programming model, which we call the PAR monad, that takes a different set of trade-offs. So in the PAR monad, what you do is express the program as a data flow model. So here's an example. Uh, we've got a program fragment here. And each of these forks, the calls to fork, generates one of the nodes in your data flow graph. So in this case, uh, this fork here is calling a function f on some argument x, and it puts the result in, uh, in the edge, a. So a is an edge of the graph here. And similarly, we've got a node over here that's calling the function g, and that puts its result into b. And we can tell by the structure of this graph, because there are no dependencies between these two nodes, fx and gx, they can be run in parallel. But the programmer doesn't have to say they can be run in parallel. The programmer just expresses the dependencies between the nodes in the graph. And the underlying infrastructure, the implementation of this library, runs that, runs that graph, schedules the graph, as it were, across the available processes and makes use of all of the parallelism that's inherent in the graph. So this gives you a slightly more explicit programming model than strategies was. So the programmer has to say a bit more about the dependencies, a bit more about the structure of the program. But in return, they get more direct control over the granularity and the dependencies. So this is a, a different set of trade-offs. If the programmer wants to have a bit more control, they can use this programming model. Um, but it doesn't give you the same kind of modularity guarantees that we had before with strategies. It also has more of an imperative flavor, so it's more familiar to programmers who are familiar with imperative languages. But at the same time, it's still deterministic. So the rule that... Uh, the rule that this programming model um, enforces is that each of these edges can only have one item of data flowing down. It. You're only allowed to put into each of those edges once. And if you do that more than once, then you get an error. So that's how the programming model as a whole is still deterministic, and you still get just one answer at the end. So one more programming model that I want to mention is called REPR. So whereas the previous two examples were focused on um, parallelism on typical Haskell programs, so sort of general purpose parallelism, REPA has a much more narrow focus. So it's focused on uh, parallelizing array computations, which tend to crop up quite a lot in the, the kind of things that you want to do in parallel programming. But the approach that REPA takes is that it gives you a set of very simple operations that you can compose together to implement your algorithms. Here's an example. So there's a map operation in REPA. So map can map a function over an array. And then zip with takes two arrays and it composes the, uh, the elements of both of those arrays pairwise by applying a function, in this case, times uh, pairwise on the elements to deliver a new, a new array. Uh, so you might think that 
this expression here generates two intermediate arrays. Okay, so we've got the result of one map here and the result of another map here, and those two feed into zip width, and that generates another array. So in fact, behind the scenes, this library manages to fuse away all of those intermediate arrays. No matter how deep you, you nest your expression, um, it manages to fuse all that away into a single tight loop and you get close to C performance, even though you're using a nice abstract high-level library. Uh, and furthermore, it parallelizes automatically. So there's one function called com uh, compute P, I think, that you use at the top. And if you use that, then it computes all of the array elements in parallel uh, on however many cores you give it. So it's a very nice library. So I've shown you three parallel programming models that we've got in Haskell. Actually, there are quite a few more. Many of them are experimental to varying degrees. Um, and the reason we've got so many is because Haskell is a, quite a nice base for building up these, uh, these abstract APIs using all of the mechanisms that we've got available. So one that I haven't shown you in particular is the, the programming model for GPUs, which shares a lot with this library called Repper. It's also based on arrays. And it looks very much like Repper, but in fact it just runs the program on a GPU. Uh, and it compiles it and executes it at runtime. So I want to switch over to talking about concurrency. And I'm going to give you an introduction to concurrent Haskell and consider a particular problem when we're dealing with concurrent programs. So the particular problem I want to think about is building up trees of threads. So trees of threads are th something that crops up quite often when you're doing concurrent programming. There's a parent thread and it generates some child threads. And then certain problems tend to arise when you do this. So if one of the child threads has a, a failure of some kind, you would like that failure to be propagated and to be handled properly in some way, in some application-specific way, usually. Uh, and at the same time, you'd like to have the property that if the parent thread dies or some problem happens with the parent thread, you would like those child threads not to be left around and not to be orphaned. So I want to think about these two problems in the context of a concurrency library. So first of all, the basics. So this syntax here is a, a type signature. So 4KO is a function, and this syntax here is saying that 4KO has the following type. This is its type. And this is a function type. The arrow indicates a function from the thing on the left to the thing on the right. And the thing on the left, in this case, is an I.O. computation. Um, so an I.O. computation is something that can have some side effects and eventually delivers a result of the type, in this case, unit. So it doesn't deliver any result at all. And 4KO itself is an I.O. computation, and it delivers as its result a thread ID that you can use to identify this particular thread. So the meaning of 4KO is that it starts running this I.O. computation in parallel, or rather concurrently with the rest of the threads in the system. So we can give an example of that. Here's the example that you usually see on page one of uh, any introduction to concurrent programming. It's the program that generates two threads, one of which is generating the character A over and over again, and the other one that's generating the character B over and over again. So when you run this program, you get lots of A's and B's interleaved, as you would expect, in some random fashion. So you might ask whether, whether threads are expensive in Haskell. In fact, threads are really, really lightweight in Haskell. We want you to use threads, so we make them really, really lightweight. You can create millions of them. Uh, and if they're all blocked, they have very little cost at all. Um, so we think of threads as an abstraction mechanism. Okay, so threads are good for modularity. They're good for uh, describing the interaction with one particular external agent separately from the interaction with other external agents. Um, so threads are a good thing. So how do we communicate between threads in Haskell? The, the very basic communication mechanism that we give people is called MVARS. So MVAR has this type signature. Uh, it's an abstract type. So MVAR has an argument, and the A stands for the type of elements that this particular MVAR contains. So MVAR is like a box. It can either contain an element or it doesn't contain an element. And there are three operations. You can create a new empty one with new empty MVAR. You can take the value from an MVAR with take MVAR, and that takes an MVAR as an argument and it delivers an IO operation that returns an A, 
namely the element from the MVAR. And you can put an item into the MVAR with put MVAR. So put MVAR takes the MVAR as an argument, it takes a value to put into the MVAR, and it doesn't deliver any result. So the diagram at the bottom here shows what happens. Uh, here is the MVAR. It's an empty box at the moment, and we've got a queue of threads all executing take MVAR. So take MVAR blocks if the MVAR is empty. And then a put MVAR comes along, and the put MVAR has a value, x. The x goes into the box. And now one of the take MVARs that was blocked can return the value x that was put into the MVAR. So this take MVAR is now unblocked. It can continue. The thread that was executing it can now go on and do whatever else it wanted to do. And the rest of the queue of take MVARs now moves up and waits for the next put MVAR to come along. So conversely, put MVAR blocks when the MVAR is full. So these two operations are completely dual to each other. You could have a queue of put MVARs here waiting to put into a full MVAR. So that's the basic mechanism for concurrency, or for synchronization rather. Let's think about a way to use it. So the way I want to use it here is to do some overlapping I.O. So rather than doing two I.O. operations end-to-end, -end, sequentially, I want to overlap them so that we get to the end faster. This isn't parallelism, this is still concurrency, we're still interacting with external web servers. Um, but what we want to do is overlap those interactions so they happen at the same time. And to achieve this, all we have to do is to do each I.O. operation in a separate thread. So I'm going to fork two threads. So here's what the code looks like. Imagine we're given an operation called get URL, which downloads a URL. And so the URL is in the string that's the argument, and it gives you the contents of that URL in the string that's returned. So here's the code. So the first line here creates an empty MVAR to put the result into. And then we fork a thread that's going to call get URL. That's what it does in the thread. So that downloads the contents of the URL and puts it into the variable r. Then the next thing we do is to put the value in r into the mvar that we created just up here. So this is downloading the URL google.com in a separate thread. And then we do the same thing again for a different URL. And then finally, you have to get the results. So when you run this program, this is going to download those two URLs at the same time and then return the results. But there's a common pattern here. right? We've had to write a lot of the same code twice. There's a pattern here where we create a new empty MVAR, we had to fork a thread, and then we had to put the result in the MVAR at the end, and we did the same thing down here. So what we'd really like to do is to abstract that pattern. Rather than saying, this is what you have to do in order to do this task, we can just abstract the pattern as an API and give the programmer the API instead. So if we do that, we end up with an API like this. So async is going to be a type that has a, a type argument, and that's the argument of the result, uh, sorry, the, the type of the result. And for now, async just contains an MVAR. So it's the MVAR that we created in the example before. And this API has two operations. So async takes the IO operation that we want to run asynchronously and returns a value of type async. Uh, that will eventually return the result A. And wait is how you wait for the result, so it takes the async as an argument. And then eventually, when that operation is finished, executing and return its result, wait returns with the value A. So I haven't given the implementation of these things, I don't want to blind you with too much code, but you have to take my word for it, they just embody the, the pattern that we had on the previous slide. So we're just creating the MVAR, forking a thread, and then putting into the MVAR. OK, so having written that abstraction, we can now go back to our code and rewrite it to use the abstraction. So this is what happens if we do that. So that's the first one. That's the second one. The code gets much simpler. And then we have to change those two take MVARs into weights at the bottom. OK, so that's nice, but we haven't thought about error handling yet. What happens if one of these operations, one of these get URLs, doesn't work for some reason? Perhaps there's a, a problem with the network. So if you ran the program and the network was disconnected, you might see something like this. So there are two failures here. 
two of these, uh, two of these lines indicate failures in the two threads. And then the main thread just got blocked indefinitely. This is an error from the Haskell runtime that tells you that the program deadlocked. Why did it get deadlocked? Well, one of these waits, it was stuck in this wait here waiting for the result, and the result was never going to arrive because the thread that was going to generate it actually died. So that's not really what we want. The whole program crashed. What we really like is the opportunity to, to catch the error, to handle it, and to, and to carry on somehow. So, the main thread deadlocked. What would we like to happen? Probably, what we'd like to happen is to have the error propagated from the thread that failed back up to the parent, back up to the, the guy that's waiting for the result. So, how can we do that? Well, we can just modify this API that we generated earlier, we wrote earlier. So, instead of just having the, the value inside the MVAR, we're going to have either an exception indicating a failure or the value. And again, we have to elaborate the code a little bit, but it's not very much. So now what happens to the behavior of wait? Well, wait changes slightly. Rather than always returning the result, now it can throw an exception if the thread that was, uh, the thread that was executing that asynchronous operation failed with an exception. The exception is rethrown by the wait operation. So that's very nice. What happens when we run this program? Now, instead of the main thread getting deadlocked and the program crashing, now what we get is a nice error message. Well, it's the same error message we got before, but now the error message is generated by the main thread as it should be, rather than the, uh, the sub-thread just dying by itself. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is to look at handling cancellation. So cancellation is something that's quite important to consider when you're doing concurrent programming. It turns up in all kinds of different places. For example, um, if you're writing a web browser and you want to be able to handle the user pressing the stop button, you'd like to be able to kill the thread that was downloading the web page, for example. Or if you're doing a background job and you have a GUI and the user can change the parameters in the GUI, um, you'd like to be able to stop the background job and restart it with the new parameters. Various different uh, scenarios in which this, uh, this idea of cancellation occurs. So cancellation is quite well supported in Haskell. We have an operation called throw to which throws an exception from one thread to another thread, and the exception is just immediately raised in the other thread. So why don't most programming languages have this? Because it's quite dangerous if the exception happens in the middle of mutating some state, but that doesn't happen very much in Haskell. Most of Haskell code is purely functional, so it's completely safe to throw exceptions all over the place. When you are handling state in Haskell, then there are a few rules that you have to follow to make this safe. Um, but it's really nice. It means that most code can be cancelled whenever you like just by throwing an exception to it. So we can add cancellation to our asynchronous API just by adding this operation called cancel. Uh, cancel takes an async and it doesn't deliver a result. It just throws the exception to the thread, which will cancel it. And cancel is defined using throw to. So now that we've got cancel, we can uh, write a little program that looks like our original program. It's downloading two URLs, but I'm going to add a new thread here. So in this thread, um, forever is an operation that does the same thing over and over again. And what it does is it gets a character from the terminal. And if the character is Q, so that is the user presses Q, it cancels these two asynchronous operations that are ongoing. So now we start downloading the URLs. If the user presses Q at any time, we can just stop them and return. So now, uh, as before, wait for the two results, but I'm going to print a message between each one so that we can tell which one's finished when we press Q. And if you run the program, well, you can press Q and you can stop it after R1. All right. And so that worked even though the library that's downloading these URLs is some big HTTP library with lots of complexity inside it. It can be cancelled at any time because we just threw an exception to it. So let's go back to the original example. What happened if the first one failed? Okay, the exception gets re-raised by this weight here. But there's a problem, right? The the async that was generated by the second line that we've called A2 is still running in the background. We've got a, 
a zombie thread in our system that we would have liked to clean up when this error occurred. So how can we do that? Well, what we need is a way to automatically cancel A2 if A1 raises an exception. So I'm going to restructure the API slightly. So instead of having the async operation, which just takes an operation and starts running it asynchronously, I'm going to provide this operation called with async instead. So with async, again, it takes the operation that we're going to run asynchronously, but its second argument is the scope of that asynchronous operation. So the idea is that the async is only going to live for as long as this function here takes to execute. So when this, when this function here, which is an IO operation, returns, we're going to automatically cancel the async that we created. So the first argument is the async operation, and the second argument is a function that we're going to apply to the async that's been created. And it indicates the scope that we want to, uh, that we want the asynchronous operation to live for. So this sort of with something is quite a common pattern in Haskell. We see this for lots of things that create a resource and then need to ensure that the resource is cancelled again, or the resource is freed again, or, or somehow released. So we see this cropping up quite a lot in Haskell. So we can now rewrite this program. Rather than using async, we can use with async. So it's quite a simple transformation. We do it like that. So the second argument to with async here is this lambda here. So lambda is an anonymous function. Uh, this anonymous function with argument A1, and then the rest of the code here is the argument. So we're doing that twice. In the second case, here is the beginning of the argument and, and the end of it's down here. So there are now two nested scopes. So with this first with async scopes over the rest of the code here, and the second with async scopes over just the two weights. And now we're guaranteed no zombies. Right? Because if the first weight here, if that throws an exception, the exception propagates outside of the first scope, or the, the innermost nested scope, and that will automatically cancel the operation. Okay? Um, so with async, it turns out, is very simply expressed in terms of a function called bracket, which we use for, uh, for catching exceptions and cleaning up in Haskell. So we're getting close to the gold now. Look what we created. We've created uh, a tree of threads, a parent with two children. In what sense? Well, if the parent dies, we clean up both of the child threads. If A1 dies, then we clean up A2. Ah, well, if A2 dies, we're still stuck at the first weight here. We haven't managed to clean up that one. So we haven't quite managed to get full, uh, full symmetrical behavior here. What we'd really like to have is a symmetrical version of this that behaves the same way regardless of which one of the asynchronous operations dies. So all we need to implement that is a function called weight both. So weight both is like doing two weights but it looks at both of its arguments at the same time, and if either of them throws an exception, then wait both propagates the exception out to the caller. So that's the symmetrical operation that we need. How do we implement it? Well, you can implement it using MVAR, but it's a bit of a pain, actually. You have to create a couple more threads that manage the intermediate communication. Using something called software transactional memory, we can implement this without using any extra threads. Now, I haven't got time, unfortunately, today to go into software transactional memory, but you'll have to take my word for it that it simplifies the implementation of this operation and means that you don't need any extra threads. So now that we've done that, the pieces are coming together and we can define a nice operation called concurrently. So concurrently takes two arguments, two IO operations that we want to perform concurrently, and it runs them both concurrently. If they both return a result, then concurrently returns a pair of the results. If either of them throws an exception, the exception is re-raised by concurrently. And it's implemented very straightforwardly with two with asyncs and a weight both. So the same pattern that we had before, we just replaced the two weights with a weight both. So this is where I was aiming at with all this development. We've arrived at a nice compositional API for doing concurrency. We can
fork two operations concurrently, and each of those can fork more operations on their own, and we can generate a nice tree of threads. And the tree of threads is always collapsed from the bottom up. Okay, so I've nearly finished. No, we don't lose any exceptions, we don't lose any zombies. So I'm just going to skip to the key points that I wanted to talk about. So we have parallelism and concurrency. So the, um, the key difference between parallelism and concurrency is that parallelism is declarative and deterministic. Parallel programming is about arriving at the answer quicker, whereas concurrent programming is about having multiple interactions and managing those interactions. And the ability to abstract cleanly is really essential. So in Haskell, we give you these very simple primitives, threads and MVARs. And on top of that, we can build very nice abstractions just using the, uh, the facilities that Haskell provides for doing abstraction, like higher order functions, and the fact that you can pass IO operations around as first class citizens as arguments. That's the end of the talk. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>